spread the word for our future um, speaker series that we would welcome parents as well as students to attend. Um, one of my uh, main goals in terms of my leadership role here is to distribute the leadership to others. And so as you know, we will have a number of different speakers come to talk to us through our speaker series on a variety of different topics. But what's important to me is that I distribute and share in the welcoming of each speaker. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Dr. Fine, who is the lovely individual who made the connection between La Jolla Country Day School and Dr. Coyle. Thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be here to introduce Dr. Coyle. So um, I met Dr. Allison Coyle on an aircraft carrier. Um, we were both um, nominated actually by a, a parent at La Jolla Country Day School to be part of a distinguished visitor program. And I think they kind of didn't know what to do with these two PhD women. Um, and so they, we were roommates and we hit it off right away. And um, it's really been a wonderful journey being her friend for the last few years. I've learned a lot both about um, sort of the things that she's going to talk about, our own unconscious bias, and sort of how to combat that in my own life. So she's been a great friend. Um, so uh, Dr. Coyle is the Ingrid and Joseph W. Hibben Chair, Professor of Physics at UCSD. In addition, she's the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and the Faculty Equity Advisor in the Division of Physical Sciences at UCSD. Um, Dr. Coyle has been featured as an opinion writer in Wired Magazine. Um, writing about issues of gender bias in the sciences. Um, what I've been most impressed with with Allison is her commitment to making the science world a more equal playing field. Um, so please help me welcome Dr. Coyle to help us better understand how our own unconscious bias and gender stereotypes um, so that we can better serve our students. Thank you. So I am actually an astrophysicist by trade. So uh, for 20 years now, over 20 years, I've been doing astrophysics research. I study galaxy evolution or how galaxies change with cosmic time, and I study accreting supermassive black holes. And in my career, thank you, I think it's pretty cool too. And in my career as I've gone up, especially after becoming a faculty member and then moving up through the faculty ranks, I started seeing bias. Or, or overt bias. Um, and I started getting more interested in um, issues of equity and inclusion. Um, I see it all the time at faculty hiring stage and in the promotion, especially at the tenure stage, and also in terms of leadership roles. Um, so as I've moved up through my career, I've gotten more and more interested in this topic. And so now I actually split my time between doing astrophysics research and teaching and then being an associate dean for equity, diversity, and inclusion at UCSD in the Division of Physical Sciences, which is math, physics, and chemistry departments. Um, it's a topic that is, I think, really interesting and important. And it's, it's, while it's pervasive in our society, it's particularly important in education. So I'm really happy to have this opportunity to be here today to talk to you about it in terms of how it plays out in the classroom and what you can do about it. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna introduce, first I'm gonna go through some concepts and terms, and they're related to bias in general in society and then specifically in schools and in the classroom. And um, we'll talk about ways that you can treat students more equitably. And the first part of the talk is gonna be more on terms and concepts, and then the second part, we're gonna have a lot of concrete examples of things that you can do to combat this. It can be very discouraging to first hear about these issues without hearing the, what you can do about it. So don't worry, we will get to a lot of specific examples later. Um, and I just want to point out that the, what we're going to be talking about will benefit all of the students. And it will actually benefit the faculty and the staff too. It will create a more inclusive environment for everyone. Um, and we'll have concrete examples of things that you can do in the classroom and then more generally in the school at large. Sorry, this is just sort of background. I'm going to go back and forth. And then the reason that we're talking about this is that most Americans are broadly committed to the ideal that individuals should be judged based on their merits, not based on their group identity. It just turns out, though, that that's not happening as often as we would like it to be. So we have an opportunity here to align our actions with our values better. Okay, so first I just want to go through some terms that you may have heard of and talk about how they're different. So um, we'll talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and then inclusive classroom. So diversity is the one that people are most familiar with. That has to do with who's in the room, just the demographics. Usually people think in terms of gender and ethnicity or race. This can also be a diversity of past experiences, socioeconomic background, viewpoints, religion, et cetera. Again, it has to do with who, who's here, who's in the room. Equity has to do with equal treatment, how you treat the people in the room, and making sure that you're treating people the same and not treating them differently based on their demographics, based on gender, race, ethnicity, 
religion, etc. And then inclusion is a broader term that has to do with the environment or the climate that you're creating. So this is related to opportunities, access, who, who gets to come into the room, um, how supported are people once they're in the room. So this is a broader term. And the reason I bring it up is because I want to talk about ways that you can create inclusive classrooms. And this means a classroom where the students feel equally valued and supported. And the needs are met for students from a variety of backgrounds. OK, so again, diversity has to do with who, and equity inclusion has to do with how. I think it's better to focus on equity inclusion than just diversity. There are studies that have shown that just increasing the diversity of a place doesn't actually lead to equity or inclusion. Um, as people from diverse backgrounds probably know from personal experience, it's not a shock to you. One way it's, it's, it's phrased is you can't just add women or minorities and stir. <laughs> That's insufficient. Okay, so another term I want to talk about is unconscious, or sometimes it's called implicit bias. So everyone has unconscious bias. Um, this is a preference for groups. It can be positive or negative. It's often operating outside of our awareness. That's why we call it unconscious as opposed to conscious bias. It's based on stereotypes and attitudes that we hold. And these stereotypes and attitudes are socially constructed and they're taught to us. So they're taught to us when we're very young. Um, and so they develop, we develop them early in life and they tend to strengthen over time. It doesn't, I just want to be very clear, um, we're not bad people because we have biases. It means that we are well socialized. We've been taught these things, they're part of our cultural context, and if we learn how to exist in our culture, we learn these things. So we tend to rely on these preferences and biases more when under time pressure or in ambiguous situations. So this is relevant often for the things that we do as faculty members um, at UCSC, and I'm sure it's relevant here for your school as well. So just to be really clear, everyone has a conscious bias. This isn't something that just white men need to think about, able-bodied cis, blah, 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 rich <laughs> white men. This is something that both men and women hold biases around gender, and both white people and people of color hold biases around race. These are very widely culturally shared, and they can be subtle, and they're very systemic. So what I want to do is first talk a little bit about some studies. We're gonna, it's going to be a little academic, and then we're going to get into the applied part. So I want to start by just going through a handful of studies. So there's been hundreds of sociology research studies on unconscious bias. This is decades of work. Um, many of them are focused on education. I'm more familiar with the ones that are focused on universities because I spend a lot of my time talking to faculty about these studies, and I try to find studies that are specifically relevant for faculty and universities. There are some that, are, that were done at high schools as well. And um, all, everything that I'm going to talk about today is relevant for classrooms at all levels. And it turns out that unconscious bias starts really early. It actually starts in preschool, um, which if any of you have ever had a preschooler, maybe you've seen this yourself. Um, but there are studies that show that even at preschool level, the teachers treat the male and female children differently, and parents treat their um, children differently based on gender. So for example, the, they're let, they let the boys um, be, take more physical risks, and they say to the girls, be careful. Um, there was one study that was really disturbing and weird that was that parents, when they had multiple children, they had their eyes on the more attractive child more often, and so that child ended up being safer than the less attractive child. I'm not exactly sure how they quantified that in their study. Um, but anyway, parents do this, teachers do this, and there was a study that showed that as early as age six, girls think that boys, this kills me, are um, smarter and more capable. So this is happening you know, from the get-go. Anyway, it starts early and um, has serious effects throughout people's lives. Okay, so just to go through some, some studies very briefly, the early studies on unconscious bias, what they often did was they would take, they would make up a fake resume or CV and they would have two identical resumes and they would just change the name and then they would send them to different groups of people and have them rate them and say things like, how likely are you to ask this person to interview for a job? So this first one at the top, again, identical qualifications. The only difference was the name Brian versus Karen and the CV that was Brian was preferred to the CV with the name Karen by a factor of two to one. So this is not a small effect. 
Um, other studies did this looking at race, where African American names were substantially less likely to be asked to interview compared to white names. Um, so that those were, were made up resumes. This next one, they looked at actual postdoc fellowship applications. So this is after PhD, before faculty level. And this was in the health sciences. And they found that women had to be 2.5 times more productive, meaning in terms of paper outputs, to be rated equally scientifically competent as the average male by the faculty who were doing this study, who were, who were rating these applications. Um, that study, they found that the, the peer reviewers overestimated male achievements and or underestimated female performance. This next one's pretty well known. Um, the way that, so it used to be that symphonies had a lot more men than women, and people wondered why, because their, your gender shouldn't be related to how well you can play an instrument. And what they realized was that you could see, so the way that it works is like, you guys are in the audience, I come out, I play my instrument, and I walk up to you, and you can see me. And they realized that if they put a screen up so that you could hear me but not see me, um, there was less of a gender imbalance. But then they discovered that it depended on the floor. If the floor was hard, you could hear heels. The, 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 the shoes sounded different. So then they had to put carpet. So once there was a carpet and a screen, then um, there was greater gender equity. So the, the probability of women advancing increased by 50%. Again, these are not small effects. I'm not talking about 5, 10% effects here. Um, another one that I think might be relevant for, for you all is letters of recommendation. So this was looking at letters of recommendation that faculty at universities wrote for students who had worked with them. And they found, so again, it was in health sciences, and they found that the letters for the women were shorter than the letters for the men, and they provided minimal assurance. And what they meant by that was they raised more doubts, more doubts about scientific independence, leadership. And then the, on the whole, they described the women more often in terms of words like caring, or refreshing, or diligent, or hardworking. And for the men, they more generally, on the whole, praised things like research brilliance um, and career achievements. So I don't know if people here write letters for, yes, okay, so here's one specific example that will, will be relevant for you. And again, we'll come back to later about what to do about this. I just want to go through a few more kinds of um, studies. So here's some more recent ones. This one, being a woman um, professor in science was very interesting for me. This was, again, a, a big resume um, from a student application for a lab manager position, where again, it was identical CVs, and then they just changed the gender of the name, male to female. And they sent this to actual science faculty, biology, chemistry, and physics faculty at research-intensive universities. And then they found, this is um, showing competence, hireability, and mentoring, where the dark is the rating for the male name, and the light is the rating for the female name. Again, identical CVs. So when the, they knew that the student was male, faculty, both men and women, um, rated them as more competent, more likely to hire, more likely to mentor, which is weird. And then this one's not on here, but also offered a higher salary. And in this study, the gender of the faculty participants did not affect the responses. So the, the women faculty were as biased as the male faculty. Okay. So gender bias has been shown to be particularly strong in the sciences, which is likely partly why it continues to be a male-dominant field. There's also studies that look at bias in teaching evaluations. Do you guys get rated by your students? I mean, I don't mean online, I mean, for real. <laughs> okay. um, so we, this happens, of course, to us too, and it's relevant in our promotions. Um, and there's many, many studies on this. I'm just gonna talk about one in particular. This one has a small sample size, so it's. I don't know that it's statistically significant, but I like the design of this one. So in general, these studies find that students um, are just harsher critics of women uh, professors than, than men professors. So in this study, the reason I like this one is because there's a control sample of sorts. So what they did is there, there were two, this was an online course, and there were two instructors. So one was an actual woman and one was an actual man. But because it was an online course, they never saw their students face to face. And so half the time, each of them pretended to be the opposite gender with half of their courses. And then they have them, the students rate the professors on 12 different traits, which ranged from teaching effectiveness to interpersonal skills. And so this is showing the ratings for, the mean ratings for the actual male professor and the actual female professor, so identical. And then this is showing the perceived female, sorry, perceived male, so when the person said they were male. So half the time they weren't, half the time they weren't. And then perceived female. 
And they found that, so again, this was a small sample, but they found that on all 12 out of 12 traits, again, which ranged from teaching effectiveness to interpersonal skills, the perceived male was rated higher, even though there was no difference in the ratings between the two actual individuals. I, I just think it's a really nice, uh, a well-designed study. So this is known that there are these biases in teaching evaluations, at least at UCSD, I've never found anybody who um, explicitly takes this into account uh, during promotions. When you talk to people, they say, oh, I guess I've heard of that. But it's not uh, sort of quantitatively or even qualitatively explicitly taken into account during promotions. This is another study that I really enjoyed because it's, it's very close to my real life. So this was, a, this was faculty response to a prospective graduate student. So what these people did was they, wrote, they sent out emails that were very realistic. Um, so to more than 6,000 faculty members across a range of disciplines, including physical sciences, from a make perspective graduate student, asking to meet them next week for a 10 minute discussion. And the email is fantastic. It's just like the ones I actually get. It says something like, dear professor, sorry this is late. I'm gonna be on campus next week. Do you have 10 minutes? Like the tone was perfect. And it was sent sort of late. It was just really, nothing about it looked fake. <laughs> it was, they really got the tone right. Um, so again, here they, they sent these identical emails, but then they changed the names. And this study, they looked, they varied both gender and ethnicity together. Most studies I'm aware of look at one or the other independently. And they found that the faculty response was significantly higher for white male names than for women or underrepresented male names. So what that means, I, I was like, can you give me some examples? So for example, Brad Anderson got significantly more responses than Keisha Thomas, Juanita Mark. Martinez or Mai Chen. And the gap was actually highest for Mai Chen for the Asian women names. Both and there was a difference both in terms of whether they got a response and how long it took them to get the response. So what this implies is there's a difference in access to faculty by students depending on their uh, gender and ethnicity. Okay, just like I think that's mostly it for the the studies. So basically all of these studies point to I wanted to show you a variety because it can come up in many, many different ways, but the thing that's in common here is evaluating somebody. Whenever you're evaluating somebody, that's when this bias comes up. So, for example, I was trying to think of when this might come up here. So, student admissions, perhaps, when you're evaluating students. Grades, I used to think grades, especially in physics, grades are objective. Like, this isn't English or art. <laughs> There's an answer, and it's a multiple choice, and you got it or you didn't. Um, but here's, this is an anecdote, but just to show you how this can work in physics, um, maybe don't tell anyone outside this room <laughs> the story, I realize we're being recorded. Anyway, um, a faculty member at UCSD in a science department, who was male, um, white male, had a course where students worked in pairs to build um, experiments and run them, and then they showed them to the class, and then part of their grade was they had to do a presentation on what they had built, show it, and talk about it. And um, this person taught this course for several years, and then a new faculty member, who was um, Latino, came in and took over the course, and he team taught for one quarter to learn how to do it. And he realized that in the pairs where there was a man and a woman, the man was getting a higher grade, and he couldn't figure out why. And it was because during the presentation, the men tended to speak, and the women didn't. And it turned out part of the grade rubric was speaking during the presentation. But the students hadn't been told that. So when the Latino faculty member took the course over, um, he told students in the rubric. And he said, you're going to be graded on speaking. And that fixed it. Then when there was pairs of where was a man and a woman, they would talk equally. So that's just one example of the way in which you would think, how could this be relevant in something like a physics course for grades, but it can be. Um, it could be relevant for giving um, extensions on assignments or extra credit. Anything where you haven't explicitly stated here are the rules that you stick to them no matter what. Whenever, whenever you're treating students sort of individually, as individual cases, or maybe just this one-off where you let someone do something, that's the kind of thing where time when bias could creep in. Um, this can come up in award nominations. So this is something I've been quantifying at UCSD is the rate at which undergraduate and graduate women and men are nominated for awards compared to their, their representation in the departments. Sometimes we find equity, sometimes we don't. So that's another thing to consider. Again, writing recommendation letters. Um, yeah. 
So there's studies that show that there can be differences there. I was trying to think again, where else this might come up here? Enrollment in advanced classes. I don't know if you have explicit cutoffs, like GPA cutoffs, or you think about who you might think would be ready for an advanced class, but that's another kind of place where that could come in. Um, internship placement, encouragement of colleges and majors, for sure. I can't tell you the number of science faculty at UCSD who have come to me since I started working on equity university and said, male science faculty have come to me and said, I have a daughter and one of her teachers told her once that she didn't need to be as good at math because she was a girl. These guys come to me year after year with these stories, like I've never heard this before. I'm like, yeah, no, I've heard that. They're all shocked every time it happens. Um, that still happens. So this is just a list I came up with quickly. I'm sure you guys know more about what happens here so you can come up with more. The last concept I want to introduce is stereotype threat. Um, this is very relevant for women and minorities in science. Um, and what this is, is when people of a certain demographic feel at risk of confirming a stereotype is when this comes up. For example, women taking math tests or underrepresented minorities taking college placement exams. So there's this really fantastic book on stereotype threat. It's called Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele, who's a professor of psychology at Stanford and he used to be the provost, which is the number two person at UC Berkeley. And people had mentioned this book to me several times and I didn't know what it was about at first and I thought, Whistling Vivaldi, that sounds sort of whimsical. Like, what is that about? It turns out, has anyone heard of this? Okay, this is so awful. So it turns out what, what that title comes from is um, as an African-American graduate student at the University of Chicago, that's in Hyde Park, uh, which is you know a mixed socioeconomic area with historically lots of crime. And I think this was, I can't remember if this was the 80s, I think it was. He found that when he was walking down the street at night, white people would be afraid of him unless he whistled Vivaldi. <laughs> And then they were fine. It's all, oh, 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 right? It's just, yeah. So he ended up, um, okay, so that's this person, Claude Steele. So he ended up doing a lot of his uh, work in psychology um, and sociology on stereotype threat. And there's been over 300 studies on this consistently finding this effect. Um, and what it leads to is women and underrepresented minorities underperform in courses, but also specifically on exams, when they feel a lot of pressure, um, where there are stereotypes that they won't do well because of their race or gender, because of stereotypes that exist in our society. Um, and there, this, this book goes through lots of examples, but they found, for example, that when you remind women or minorities that they are a woman or minority before they take a math test, then they do worse. But if you, if you say before the test, this isn't a math test, or we're not actually testing, we don't care about how you do on the math, we're testing, this is a game, or we're testing some certain cognitive thing where they think it's not really that clearly related to the math problem. Then there's no difference in their performance. They've done follow-up studies doing brain scans and find that women and minorities, again, when they're reminded about this stereotype threat ahead of time, other parts of their brain are lighting up that aren't relevant to the task at hand. So basically, they're worried about other things and they're not, they're not as focused, and they, they don't have so much brain power to work on the task again. So there's lots, they've done lots of variations on this. They've done several studies um, specifically in high school on this. And the one thing about this book is as I was reading it, I kept thinking, okay, now get to the point that, that says what I can do about it in my college level classroom. Because I can't say this isn't a test. Obviously, it's the midterm. You know it's the midterm, and you know it's 20% of your grade. Um, the book doesn't really talk about what to do about it, but I have a slide later. Um, but one thing that I've tried in my class, which I don't, this is just something I made up, but I would encourage you guys to just view your classes as labs and try things and talk to each other about what works. So just to get everybody to at least stop being so freaked out before taking an exam, I make everybody close their eyes and take a few deep breaths and I do it with them. And if their eyes are open, I say, I can see that your eyes are open. <laughs> and so they all close their eyes. I don't know if it helps, but I feel like it at least makes people not come in panicked right away which can't hurt. Okay, so this is one reason why, for example, um, there are strong differences in grades and specifically um, exams, like college placement exams, and this is the GRE for graduate school. Um, differences in the, the median and distribution of grades with ethnicity and with gender. So this is men and women, and then um, Asian American, white, Hispanic, Mexican American, Native American, African American, and you see these pretty substantial trends 
And unfortunately, at least for graduate school at R1 universities like UCSD, often they use a GRE cutoff before even looking at files to look to see who to admit to graduate school. A lot of schools have moved away from doing this because they're, in my field, in astrophysics, a lot of um, universities have looked at correlations to see if there's any correlations in the students that came there between how they did on the GRE and how they did in grad school or how they did in their careers. No one's ever found a correlation. There's correlations with other things like determination and grit, but not GRE scores. Um, so a lot of places have just gotten, gotten rid of this entirely because it's very biased and it's racist and sexist to use a cutoff. Even the ETS themselves, they say don't use a cutoff or don't just use this. But it still happens, and I've been in the room when it's happened, and it's because it's easy. This is why people do this. Because you know you have however many hundred of things, you can't read them all. So you do that, and then you go, oh, now I only have 40 to read. So that's, that's why it persists. But more and more places are moving away from doing this. Um, another thing that's interesting just to remember is that self-reports are biased. So in reporting, in self-reports of sorts of mathematical tasks in which men and women actually performed equally well on the task, men tended to exaggerate how well they did. They said they did better than they did, and women the opposite. Women said they did worse than they did. Um, so this, this difference in confidence can impact later the choice of college and, and, then, and majors and therefore career. I think this is very relevant. I see this with undergraduates all the time. Um, and I think it's related to imposter syndrome. Uh, where people doubt their accomplishments and are afraid of being exposed as a fraud. Um, I want to be careful of the time, but okay. Quickly, there was a there was an undergrad at UCSD. So I have uh, people ask me to write recommendation letters, undergrad students, for them to go to grad school all the time. And I have to say, on the whole, I have had some male students say, "Can you write me a letter? I want to apply to Yale or wherever." And they have like a B average. And I'm like, "Why are you?" to Yale, <laughs> that doesn't seem so likely that you would get in there. Um, and then on the flip side, there was this one student, a woman who had A pluses, she was the best physics undergrad we'd had in years, and she came to me and said, I don't know that I should apply to grad school, I feel like I need to do more research, I don't know that this is really for me. And I said, you should go Google imposter syndrome. And she did, and she came back and she said, okay, thank you, I've applied to graduate school. And it turns out she got in everywhere and she got to the doing really well. So. This is something I think is, is particularly relevant for women in the sciences. Okay, so what can you do about stereotype threat? So there's a bunch of things you can do. The first is you can be aware of your own biases. To make sure that in your classrooms and when you speak to students, you're not perpetuating them. You can also counter a negative stereotype in the moment if you hear a student say to another student or a teacher say to a student, you know, you don't, it's okay that you didn't do well in the math test because you're a girl. Question. How do you become aware of your own biases? Oh, so, okay, the question was, how do you become aware of your own biases? Um, just seeding this in your head, and then whenever, just trying to remember whenever you're evaluating people that this is potentially relevant, and then we'll get to this, just look at the data. You can just make lists of who did you recommend for this versus that. Just look at the fraction of men and women and minorities and not, and then look at the fraction of the people in the pool, and are they the same or not? If they're not, that's good. But just starting to think about it, and then also talking to other people about it. What are you doing in your classroom? Did you think about this when you made this nomination list? It, it's something that develops over time. For me now, it's become a habit, but it's taken me years. Yeah, so that's a good question. Can I ask another question on that? Yeah. So on that note, what are your thoughts on taking those implicit association tests on yeah. implicit? Is that something you think also is helpful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aware devices? Yeah, so you can take um, the well-known one is this Harvard implicit bias test online. It's a fun little test you can take, and it basically scores you and then shows where you fall relative to the people who've taken the test. Um, I think that's a great thing to do. I've heard from some people that it's really opened their eyes to this being a real effect. Um, so I think that that's helpful. I don't think that solves it, but I think it's a good thing to do, for sure. Is there a different category in the implicit test to Harvard? Yeah, there's a whole bunch you can take. Just pick one, see how you, pick another one. If you're, if you're like, that's not me, do another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's actually kind of fun. Um, more specifically, you can have your students write about how they don't fit stereotypes. You can spend five minutes not some like big deal. Don't have them write a three-page essay. Have them write a paragraph or two. 
just get them thinking about the ways in which they are not like a stereotype that someone might have about them. That's a great thing to do. Um, I feel like the Wisdom of Baldi would talk about this one. You can have students write about their values. I actually, I've seen a study this. I have my students do this in physics. And it's, I tell them, this might seem a little weird, it's a physics class, but they're, it's a freshman level physics class and I want to sort of get at this as early as possible. So I have them write just a paragraph or two on affirming one or two values that they hold. And you have them do that, in Wisdom of Baldi, they had underrepresented minority students do this in college. And doing that improved their grades for the whole year. It's kind of amazing how big of an effect that it has. Um, but that's something that empirically has been shown to help. Another thing that I do is you can talk with students about the growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Um, Carol Dweck has done a lot of work on this. I think this is particularly important in math and science um, for, for women and minorities. Um, so the idea here is that in our culture, we have these wrong beliefs that there are certain topics that you just have to be intrinsically skilled at to be good at like math and physics. We don't have this so much about biology, but we have it about physics. We have it about philosophy, for whatever reason. Students hear this, and this gets to them. So I have many undergrads say, I'm just not good at math. <laughs> you don't get to say that to me. What you can do is come to my office hours, and we can go through this very, very slowly, and I promise you that when you leave, you will know how to do it. Um, and in office hours, when you see students start to get it, you just start whatever level they're at, might be pretty low, fine, start there. As they get it, you say encouraging things, like, I saw you just figure that out. It's amazing to me, at least, how many undergrads have never had a faculty member say something like, like that to them. Um, so having students, talking with them about growth versus fixed mindset, that you don't have to be brilliant at this, this is a learned skill, you can improve over the, year, um, if you have, it, you know, if you know previous students who have improved, you don't have to say who they are, but you can say, I've had students where I've seen them improve, so that they know this is a real thing. Um, and just encouraging them that, that they can learn these skills is really, really useful. Um, and again, you can give students feedback that motivates them to improve. Like, I saw you just figure that out. It's really great um, when you can say that to students. Um, again, getting back to writing recommendation letters. So when you write letters, just reread it, like write your letter, and then reread it with an eye towards bias. Like, do you mention their personality or their likability or their helpfulness? Why? Is that relevant? I don't know, maybe it's for the letters you're writing. It's not for the letters that I'm reading. Um, do you mention their family? Why? Do you use power words like leader or vision or breakthrough? Are you doing that for the women as well as the men? Um, do you give a similar amount of detail or depth for everyone? Do you raise doubts about their abilities? So after reading about this study, um, one year I was writing letters of recommendation for two postdocs who were in the same field, a man and a woman, and I had worked with him and I hadn't worked with her. And so I wrote their letters and then I remembered this and I went back and his was longer, but I had worked with him, so I thought, okay, that's probably okay. But then I put them aside and I said, who do I think is better? And I thought, you know, she's actually better. Her work is having more of an impact, it's more innovative. But I hadn't, that wasn't clear in how I had written the letters. So I didn't change his, I changed hers. And I just wrote more. And I wrote about how she's been having this huge impact in the field. So I didn't, you know, say anything negative about him. I just made sure that I had said that she was a leader in a way that I thought she was, but it turned out I hadn't written. So that's the kind of thing you can do to, to counter these biases. Okay, just a few more slides. Um, Again, when you're doing things like awards or nominations or leadership opportunities or internships or whatever, just make a list of every student you're nominating. Um, and then compare the fraction of women and minorities in that list to the fraction of women and minorities in the pool or who are students who you could have nominated and just see if there's equity there. Basically, instead of treating each case individually, look at the aggregate. You can do this for admissions, leadership opportunities. Um, you could check things like the invited speaker list for the school people who are speaking to students, the board of trustees, I don't know. These are the kinds of things that, uh, that I've been looking at at UCSD. Anything I can think of, I, uh, I just make a list and look for gender equity. Um, in the classroom, you can use rubrics and grading. So just be, know before you look at the assignments, what's gonna count for what, and then let the students know that as well. Um, oh, this is an interesting one, don't grade on a curve. So there's a whole education research literature, and there are studies that talk about why it's not good to grade on a curve, and there's multiple reasons. So one is, and what I mean by this is I mean, 
um, determining grades based on comparing students to each other. I don't mean you curve the whole class. If you write, believe me, I've done this, you write an exam, you think, oh, this is a great new question I came up with, and then they all bomb it because it turns out they didn't understand the question. That was your bad, not their bad. And so you just, you know, give them all five points or whatever. I've definitely done that before. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying don't grade them on a curve compared to each other. And the reason is because it creates stress and competition between the students. Um, it hurts motivation. It hurts this growth mindset. They think, well, so and so is smarter than me. Why should I even try? They're always going to, they're just going to get the better grade. And then because they're getting the better grade, then I'll get the worst grade. I have a, I have a question on that. Yeah. When they go to college, if you're in a state university, you're going to be graded on a curve. And so shouldn't maybe you have been exposed to some of that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, that's a good question. Um, when they go to college, aren't they going to be graded on a curve? So shouldn't they have seen this? They're not necessarily going to be graded on a curve in college. I don't do this. I know a lot of faculty don't do this. Some do. Um, again, people do it because it's easy. But they won't necessarily see it in college. And even if they do see it in college, I still think supporting them as well as you can until they get to college and increasing their confidence is better than kind of making them deal with negative stuff that they're going to have to deal with later. But it's in the workplace too, right? And so it's, it's, yes. it's everywhere. So I, I get you on the insulation. Yeah. But there's also a reality element. Oh, for sure. No, no. It's not, I'm not saying they're never going to be competed. Oh, they're competing all the time. But in terms of what you can do in your classroom to support your students and lower stress and lower stereotype threat, don't agree on it. Um, another reason is that when you grade on a curve, what you're doing is you're saying there's no objective standard of achievement. You're basically saying, I don't have learning outcomes, which is not something you maybe want to say to your students. So grades don't reflect an absolute level of accomplishment. You should be able to say, if you learn this, this, and this, and this, you can do this, this, and this, you can perform this way, that's an A. Blah, 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 that's a B. If you say, I don't really know, I have to see how you are compared to the other students, it just makes it look like you don't know how to teach, I think. Um, and, it, and it reinforces stereotype threat. Again, be careful with extra credit or extensions. You just want to apply things like know your rules and then apply them equally. And also knowing your rules and saying them on the first day, then when the eighth student comes with the grandmother's in the hospital or the dog that got in whatever, and you're in the moment, you want to be like, oh, sorry. You're like, well, here, here are the rules. Like, then you can just apply them equally to everybody. Um, oh, this one's interesting. Pay attention to who you call in class. So there are studies that show that teachers tend to call on when their hands raised, they tend to call on the male students more than the female students. So that's something that I try to remember in class when I see hands to try to counter that. And actually, I had somebody who does education studies research come and sit in on my class, and he quantified. And it turns out there was parity. And he was like, did you know there was parity? And I said, that's great, because I was actually trying to, that was intentional. But I had never quantified it. OK, last slide. Um, pay attention to the order of test questions. This one's also interesting. So um, I teach some physics courses that have like two, 300 students. And we do multiple choice, because there's two or 300 students. <laughs> and it's freshman level. So, um, I have to make multiple versions of the exam where I randomize the order because they're sitting next to each other. And I found, and then it turned out there was a study that talked about this, if, if I just randomized it, one of the four, maybe there was a hard question first, then the students didn't do so well. Everybody who took that version didn't do as well. And it turns out one thing you can do to reduce stereotype threat is to not have the really hard questions come first. Because if the very first question they find discouraging, then they don't, the women minorities don't do as well later on. Um, encourage collaboration between students when possible. It just creates a more supportive environment. It reduces isolation. Specifically, again, for women and minorities in science, at least at the college level, we find that they often have a hard time forming study groups. The male students, the white students don't, or Asian students don't want to work with them. So and, uh, encouraging collaboration can help with isolation. Again, discussing this growth mindset, counter stereotypes, talk about imposter syndrome. It just helps encourage students to know what, what's happening to them, isn't that it's a thing that's known about and what they can do to counter it instead of just holding on to it without realizing that how common it is. Um, and then another place, again, is just be careful with the discussions of encouraging people in terms of which college you go to, which majors to think about. Just make sure that on the whole, you're not um, being biased in terms of the male students or the white students or Asian students going into sciences, for example. Um, this is definitely something that, that I've seen um, happen. Okay, so just to conclude, so 
just on the whole, just be aware of this potential for bias um, and check the data and make lists whenever possible. And if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to read more um, on reducing bias and stereotype threat. This was supposed to just be an introduction. And I would really encourage you to talk to each other. Find the other people who care about this and talk about what you're doing in your class and how did it work. I've been doing that at uh, ECSD. It's been really helpful to have a cohort. Um, and I mean, I'm sure you guys do this all the time, but you have a lot of influence over your students. I know it might not feel like that sometimes, but you really, really do. So um, I would just encourage you to use it to support them equally and create an inclusive environment um, for everyone. Okay, thank you. personally in terms of things getting better for the rate of change? Like, do you think that rate is something where I, we will see those changes in my lifetime or to reference your other work, it will take cosmic time? I'm not even gonna touch that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I would like to be optimistic. On the other hand, I've been doing this a little too long. So. <laughs> yeah, so I'm bummed because I did a study for my dissertation 17 years ago mm -hmm. on racial disparities in the way that victims of domestic violence were treated and a lot yeah. of the stereotypes that people had about victims of violence yeah. were actually very contrary to what they thought about black women. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very bummed to see 17 years later we're still dealing with these same issues with rate of change, but that's not my question. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the thing that I found, and it kind of gets to your question, so I work in a big biotech company and it's men galore at the top, white men. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we have found to be very, very effective, and I don't know how you guys feel about using it at school, is really just kind of rubbing people's noses in their own stereotypes, right? And bringing people in to kind of speak about, here are the stereotypes that people have, making people very aware of them, and actually having chats and discussions 
with students or with outside individuals who come in and kind of say, here's what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to hear it kind of firsthand and address it. So with, I'd be interested in understanding, have you ever tried those approaches? Yeah, so I think, the, I think the listening group kind of things work really well. Where you come in and you say, let's get all the women or minority underrepresented people together and let's talk, let's first just hear about your experience. And that really helps people understand that there's more that's been going on than, than they personally know about, which is great. I have found, so at UCSD, um, one of my roles is to train faculty who do um, hiring searches, so to hire the faculty. And when, in, in the physical sciences, so in math, chemistry, and physics, I mean, not to sound like it matches, but it's kind of one of the hardest jobs on campus because every time, and I've talked about so many studies, there's always one guy in the room who says, this doesn't apply to me. Like, I get pushed back every single time, and I have done this probably 20 times. So um, I do think it's really good to talk about these things explicitly. Uh, I think how you do it, people can get very defensive and reactive, especially the more arrogant they are in life. Those are the ones who need it, right? Yeah, exactly. So, but I do feel like um, peer pressure works well there. So fine, if you've got one person who just says, I had a guy say, special and weird. He had some term that was basically, he was trying to say, he like, I'm like, boy, you're not human? I don't understand because this is human. Behavior. But anyway, whatever. He was just like, this is not like, fine. He's still on a committee with 10 other people or however many other people. So the others, when someone says something, which I've heard people say quite explicit and biased things, they can say, no, we're not going down that road. That's another way to try to keep some people in check. But you can get pushback. It's not as simple as just being like, oh, it turned out we're all biased. And everyone's like, oh, I didn't know that. And I started paying attention to that. That's not what I found, at least with science faculty at an R1 university. I love that this is going online. Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question is, um, if you're talking about physical sciences and things like that that tend to be male-dominated, yeah. but I've heard that in professions that tend to be female-dominated, yeah. that a man, like say a male nurse, they tend to rise to the top. Oh, it's, okay, so yeah, so the bias can go, yeah, so, so I don't know about studies about male nurses rising to the top, but that wouldn't surprise me. There are studies, though, around hiring, for example, women um, studies professors where there's a bias against hiring a male in that position. So you're right. I was focused, because I do mostly talks around um, women in science, I was focusing on male dominated fields. But there are biases in female dominated fields, and they can play out in some of the same ways, but also in some different ways. It's hard to think of much where this like, isn't relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow up on Lori's question, so it is true that in female-dominated disciplines, there's research that shows that men are more often put in leadership positions, and when women enter a field that was more typically male, salaries go down. Um, and, and vice versa. Result. Yeah. So as men got into computer science, then the salaries went up. Yes. Yes. Good times. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, I wonder if you could talk because at one point you were really an astrophysics professor, and now I a think big I'm portion still of your, yeah, which you're doing that as well, but you know that was your whole job, yeah. and now you have a big portion of your job doing this. And I wonder if you could talk about sort of your learning curve. What are some of the ways that you learned about this? Maybe some resources that you might be interested in. As an undergraduate, I was one of the only women in the room in physics courses, which I didn't like. And I you know, had a hard time getting study groups, and I would watch men harass the handful of other women, blah, blah, blah. So it was a thing that was happening, but it wasn't something that I was consciously aware of. So I just sort of did like how it together. Um, and I think that people who do that do better. It's like it's better when you're not aware of it but before you have power to do anything about it. Um, then when I became a faculty member, I went to a physics department where I was the only female astrophysics faculty member and only one of three women faculty out of 45. So it was a very different kind of, I'd always been in the strong um, So it just became much more stark. And then I started seeing it more, and it was really at the hiring level and the promotion level, which gets back to the leadership. Um, then when you look at who's, we did a study around who's been department chair and vice chair and um, chairs and board committees, and there's a lot of gender inequities there. Um, so I just started seeing it more and more as I went up. But I actually think it's kind of good in a way not to know too much about it until you can do something about it because it just feels awful to see it and not be able to do anything about it. 
So I've given talks on unconscious bias. I've been asked to give them at universities where undergraduates were in the room. And I actually wasn't super comfortable with that. But I didn't, you know, they can do what they want. But the students came up to me afterwards and they said, what am I supposed to do when I go ask somebody to write me a letter of recommendation? There's nothing you can do. You can you could tell them that you know that there are biases, but I would not think I would say that you should do that. That might really backfire. So um, I don't know. Like this sounds awful, but it's kind of best to just like keep your head down, but find peers. Talk to other. Like when I talk to students, I try to really focus on things that they can do. So peer mentoring is really really important. Um, I feel like another thing that's really important that isn't talked about that much, so peer mentoring is finding you know, people of your, your same level. I actually think it's really helpful to talk, to be a mentor to people just behind you. So like eighth graders to sixth graders, you know, or 10th graders to eighth graders. Because you realize in doing that how far you've come in the last year or two. Um, so I think that's really helpful. Um, I'm not really answering your question, but in a way it's almost best to not know too much about this until I feel like until you have something else. Yeah. Can I follow up on that just a little bit? Yeah. Because they created the position of director for you based on the so work that you've been yeah. doing. Did they also, how did they empower you in that role? It sounds like, because that's part of it, right? You yeah. About power. Yeah. What, what kind of power do you have? Yeah, so so I was a faculty equity advisor, which was a role that the university, so our chancellor cares a lot about these topics, and he created some, some positions. I had one of those, but that role doesn't actually have a lot of power. But in that position, I started asking to do more. So I asked the dean at the time if I could do a salary equity study. But she was like, oh, really? You want to do that? But he let me. He gave me the data. Um, and it turned out there, there weren't big inequities, which was sort of surprising. Um, so I don't know. I just asked to do more and more, and people let me. But I'm at a place where the upper administration really cares about this. Without support from above, it's really, really hard to change this kind of stuff. Um, it's also not great. Another thing that I've seen, I feel like this, I don't know if this happens more in industry or in universities, but it's kind of a thing now to talk about this, and so places will say we're doing things, but, and then people who work there get very excited, and they think, oh, this is finally gonna change, and then they don't do very much, and then people are actually more upset. So it's actually not good to go around saying, oh, we care, and then not follow up. Um, for a number of years, we've been doing sort of analysis of grade distribution that we, but just middle school through through um, through upper school. And upper school is perhaps a little bit easier because of um, just the semester system versus middle school. If you teach middle school, there's lots of different layers to the grades. And when looking at the distribution of grades, it's very easy just to get stuck on, oh, what is an A, what is a B? But then when you drill down further in terms of the distribution between male and female, or the distribution between gender or ethnicity, and I could go on and on and on, it really tells a narrative and it tells a story. And one that can be really intimidating, um, if I were to go, go to a, a teacher and say, hey, let's talk about this, um, where they would feel as if that's an indictment that I'm not doing a good job or what have you. And that, that's not my point. So I'm, my question is, how do we create an environment in which we can be transparent right. to look at the distribution of grades, but what I'm currently grappling with, that's too late. That grade, once it's in the system as in a semester grade or a trimester grade, it, it's somewhat, it's done. So how have you or do you know of studies in which we're looking at formative feedback and formative, and I know it's not about grades, so, but how can we actually, or do you have experience with creating little study groups or micro groups or improvement groups around holding or being open to say, hey Colleen, I want to sit down and look at my grades from last year and how I distributed them and I'd like to unpack that first with you and then I want to bring it to my department and then I want to bring it to my, my team. Yeah. That's a really good question, and there are several parts to that. So, so the first is just having a discussion to get everybody on board with the goal and the concept and equity, and make sure everybody affirms that first. Because you need that before people are going to say, OK, I'll hand you my grade book, because now I know what you're doing. <laughs> so, and then the other thing to just keep reminding people, again, is that we all have these biases. It's probably, unless you're actively countering them, they're probably gonna be there. 
So this isn't some sort of personal indictment that you're an evil person because you have differences in your grade distribution based on these characteristics. Again, if you do, it's because you were well socialized and you're aware of that. So, so they, I would just focus on like, you know, we want to improve. And so here's our goal. You've got to know where you're at to get there. So let's quantify where we're at and then let's mark our progress as we get there. In terms of um, catching it in time, I don't know, this stuff takes so long <laughs> to deal with. Just wait till the end of, just take the grades from last year, it's fine. Um, I, we've been doing this, or I've been doing this at UCSD, quantifying all kinds of things in terms of equity and then going to the department chairs and the faculty and saying, here are the results, here's where we had equity, here's where we didn't. And it's not true that just within a year, everyone goes, oh, I guess we're gonna fix that. And this takes a lot of time. So, but what we're doing at least at UCSD is now figuring out what data we wanna be tracking every year and doing an identical analysis so we can see this getting better over time. Um, I'm curious how, how much of the studies that on your review, and I imagine there are studies in this, although I don't know for sure, but that look at the socialization, and um, I, I imagine it's very engaging. So yeah. like you're seeing kids when they're basically, they're, they're adults, right? I mean, they're still sort of kids in college, but they're yeah. essentially adults. So um, how can we as a society work on socialization to make that more equitable? Because in my eyes, that's really where the long-term change can occur. Yeah. If we treat, so for example, if a, if a, a three-year-old girl's crying and, and you tell her, uh, it's okay, it's okay, and a three-year-old boy is crying and you're saying, tough it up, then though that's, a, that's a decision that our society made. Right. And like, so, what? it's very tricky because you, you can't tell people how to parent, right? And they may, have, they may feel like they have, yeah. there may be valid reasons for that, right? In their eyes, like, how do you approach it at a societal level? Because sometimes it can feel too, too late to make a significant change on so I would say two things. One is you're absolutely right that it needs to start early. Um, and so I have actually, I have a daughter who's five and when she started preschool, um, I went, I talked to the director of preschool and I said, I work on these topics, do you want me to come talk to the teachers about it? Because I had heard some of them say certain things because boys and girls that were uh, not equitable. And uh, she had me come talk to them. So I did a little thing with the preschool teachers. So we, you know, we can be talking to preschool teachers. They have a lot of influence, again, more than I think they realize. So I think it, we, we do need to be starting early. Um, you guys know this better than I do, but because I'm a parent, I also know this. Yeah, telling other people how to parent, don't do that. Um, <laughs> what you can say is, I've noticed this about myself. I've started paying attention myself to not telling my daughter, oh, be careful, or saying to the boy, why are you crying? Here's things I've been doing. Um, but the other thing I would say is, it's never too late. So I have had students at the college level like the woman with the imposter syndrome. She, it turns out, I didn't know any of this, she was first generation college student. Like, of course nobody had said anything about my grad school. She didn't even know how to do that. It's never too late. It's just amazing to me how all it takes is one person with some power saying something can actually totally change the direction these students take. So, so it's never too late. I mean, I know what you're saying, um, but I, so talk to the preschool teachers and talk to students at every single and you know we're all adults. Like it's relevant for us too, right? Like it's, I mean, you can be working on this for the day that too. I know we're kind of out of time. So. Um, I'm happy to stick around if there's a few more questions. Well, I, I hope you look at this as your first of many visits here. Oh, I'm glad you to come back. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to take advantage of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what Ari said really struck me. If, if we're saying that we've been socialized and we're part of that issue, yeah. then we have a responsibility to fix it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.